Morning, everybody. We're a couple of minutes late, but we've just been inundated with children, which is so exciting. So if you can't hear from the children, there's plenty of spaces up the front here where you'll be able to hear much better and keep me company. So it's great to have all the children here today. Also, welcome to all the online community who are watching uh, the service. Uh, you might be a bit quieter than us today at home, but that's fine, and we'd love to have you with us. Could you please stand, and Kevin will bring the scriptures in uh, to the chapel, which uh, simply sig signifies that our worship and our message is founded fully on the scripture. Please be seated. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 148. We seem to always like to read a psalm to get our service going, and today it's Psalm 148, verses 1 to 5. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, your highest heavens and your waters above the seas, uh, above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord. Let us praise the name of the Lord as we stand and sing our first hymn, which is Thine Be the Glory. Thank you. Please be seated. I'm going to uh, lead us in a prayer this morning uh, from one of Tanya's wonderful prayer books written by Anne Graham Lotz. And this one is titled, A Prayer to the Rock of Our Salvation. And it certainly speaks to me this day. Let's pray. Rock of Ages, we welcome you, Elohim, 
the strong one. You were in the beginning, you will be at the end. You always have been, you always will be. You are the creator who brought forth something out of nothing, who formed men from dust, who, who turns darkness into light, who makes the world turn, who sustains all things by your powerful word. When nations rage and people imagine a vain thing, when the rulers take a stand and gather together against the Lord, when the earth gives away, when the mountains fall in the midst of the sea, when the waters roar and foam, when nations are in uproar and kingdoms fall, when everything that is familiar unravels, you are the rock on which we stand. You are our stronghold. We take refuge in you. We hide ourselves in you. We worship you alone. And today we confess our deep need for you. O oh God, our help in ages past, we ask you to intervene on our behalf. As we plunge into spiritual and moral darkness, we ask you to be our light as political, social, racial, financial and environmental storms tend to rage all around us, be our anchor. As we face various threats and vows of annihilation from our enemies, be our shield. When there are wars and rumours of wars, be our peace. In our weakness, be our strength. As we grieve over lost freedoms and lost futures and lost values and lost loved ones, be our comfort. In our despair over our lack of moral leadership, be our hope. In our confusion when truth is exchanged for a lie, be our wisdom. In these days of desperation and confusion, we look to you and you alone. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. Uh, I'm not 100% sure who's doing offering this morning. Is anyone? <laughs> uh, Tom's been working hard behind the scenes this morning to get us up and running with the tech. And now we have a little film clip from Paul Murray, uh, which I'd like to bring to you. Hey guys, just got back today from a full day out flying in this little girl here back at the hangar. Just wanted to say thank you so much for your support and to give you guys a brief update. One thing is uh, today's the first day that I had a guy called Rajiv flying out with, with me today. He's a local guy from Luma. He's a Walmajiri man and he's about to take him out to Wal Walmajiri country so that he can go and spread the gospel to his own people. That was absolutely fantastic. So that's one thing we can be praising God for. But a couple of things you can be, you can be praying for. Continue to be praying for our safety, especially as we're flying out in the Kimberley here, and especially as we're coming into the wet season. Continue to pray that we'll be able to get out to these communities. Um, and again, I've got a big flight over to Queensland and back again coming up. So we'll be praying for some safety over that. That's at the end of September. Now, also, one thing you can be praying for, continue to be praying for more workers. Now, obviously, we've got larger, and that's fantastic, but we do need more people. And we'll continue to need more people. So still be praying that God would provide more people to come up here to spread the gospel and to tell people about his good news. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much and keep on praying for us. So we give thanks for Paul and his amazing work that he's doing in the Kimberley. I've got a confession. I've got to break Cobus' arm so he can't get that flight and I get to fly to Queensland with, uh, <laughs> with Paul. It's going to be an amazing trip. I'm not really going to break your arm, you'll probably break mine. <laughs> let's, let's give thanks. Oh God, thank you for your amazing power and your work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and your blessings over us. Thank you that we can hear about Paul and the mission work up there of his uh, new helper that you've brought to him. 
And we just pray today for uh, the work in the Kimberley, for Paul's safety as he flies around, but also that your Holy Spirit will uh, go ahead of him wherever he goes and that um, Paul's words may be fruitful and his witness fruitful. So, Father, we thank you for them in their, in their work. Thank you that you're able to bring hope even in the toughest of times, whether it be in the, in the Kimberley or in the Wheat Belt or in some foreign land, and you're strengthening us for your purposes. Thank you that our weakness, that in our weakness to choose love, to love us and to involve us in your plans. Thank you for your great love and your care for us. Thank you for your mercy and grace for us. Thank you that you're always with us and will never leave us. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice that we might have freedom and life through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your amazing providence, answered prayer and endless blessings. And Father, the um, offering that we bring this morning is just a small token of that thanks and we ask that you'll bless it. Help us to remember and recognise these things in the daily fog of life as we, as we blunder along. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are and all that you do and all that you've given us and help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh each day. Please renew our spirits and replenish us with your peace and your joy and we give you praise and thanks for you alone are worthy today in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time to sing again. <clears throat> Luke and Silas and Tanya will be on the music team today. Stand and sing. Thank you, everybody. Please be seated. <clears throat> Can I ask Sarah to 
come forward and bring us the first Bible reading, please, which is from Romans. I'll be reading from Romans 13, verses 8 to 14. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of love to one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not con commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does not ha do harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of the darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decency, decently and in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to glorify the desires of the flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Our, our Old Testament reading this morning is all about the Passover uh, in Exodus chapter 12 and I'm going to read from verses 1 to 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in, Egypt, Aaron in Egypt, This month will be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month each man is to take a lamb for his family one for each household, and if any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbour. Having taken into account the number of people there are, you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with each per what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water but roast it over the fire, head, legs and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it's left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. On the same, that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. It's a pretty grim sort of a reading to lighten us up today, isn't it? Children, we're going to have a children's story about some grim things. Do you know what? One of the key things to this story today is a yo-yo. And I know that I have a yo-yo in my house. And do you think I could find it this morning? Anywhere. I looked high and I looked low. So what do we know about yo-yos? Have you ever seen a yo-yo? Yeah, yeah, well lots of people have seen yo-yos. What do yo-yos do? Someone? Anyone? Yeah, shout it out. They go up and down. On, on a bit of string, that's right. So it's got a little loop on the end of the string so it doesn't fall off. 
Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. So I just so wanted to bring it today because I was sure Mr. Bennett or Mr. Tengville or one of these famous people would be able to do all sorts of tricks today with their with a yo-yo. Because when we were your age, yo-yos were fantastic things. So Mr. Bennett would have been able to walk the dog. Mr. Tengville would have been able to go around the world. Rock the cradle. Anything else people used to do? Sydney Harbour Bridge. All these things, okay? But the, 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 the point of the story is today, sometimes we have lots of up and down, ups and downs in our lives. Ups and downs, ups and downs. Sometimes we're happy, other times we're what? Sad. Sad. Sometimes we're really good and sometimes we're really bad, N naughty. Sometimes we try really hard and sometimes we just... Yeah, we're just lazy, aren't we? We don't do what we're told. So today we're going to do lots of ups and downs. And this is a big people can do this too if they haven't done their exercise for the week. So we're going to go through a story and when things are good, we jump up. And when things are bad, we fall on the floor again, okay? You reckon you can do that? Yeah! Very good. So you probably didn't hear what I was reading about all that blood and gore and killing the pet lambs and all that, did you? Yeah! Right, yeah. So what, what, what the story was about there is that the Israelites, who were God's favourite people, they had been slaves for a long time. Is that, is that an up or is that down? That's a down. Yeah. Israel had been slaves. And Moses and his brother Aaron went to see Pharaoh and asked the Pharaoh, the king, to please set God's people free but the Pharaoh said, no. Is that a down or is that an up? That's a down. Mm. Because Pharaoh didn't say yes, he wouldn't, say, wouldn't do what God asked, God began to send terrible, terrible things to the people of Egypt. They were called plagues. Does anyone know what a plague is? Some of you would probably know recently we had a mouse plague. Did you have mouses in your house? Yeah. They're everywhere, weren't they? In Egypt, in Egypt they had lots of plagues. They had ten of them. They had fleas. They had flies. They had locusts. All sorts of things. Is that an is that a up or a down? Oh, that's, a, that's a down. Yeah, yeah. So every time Moses would come to the Pharaoh and he's after the plague and the Pharaoh would say, yes, I've had enough, your people can go. Is that an up or a down? That's an up. And then what happened, do you think? Pharaoh thought, hang on, I can't let them go, they're all my slaves. I've changed my mind. Is that a down or a down? Yeah. Yeah. But because Pharaoh was so hard-hearted, God got really tired of him. And we come to the story that we read in, in the Bible this morning about the Passover. And that's where this is, I reckon this is a real downer. Because God said, did you hear what I said in the Bible readings? God said, I'm going to kill all the firstborn sons and the firstborn animals. So what did the Israelites have? Is, it, is that an upper or a downer? Well, I think that's a serious downer, isn't it? So what did God say to the Israelites? He said they had to kill their pet lamb. Maybe it mightn't have been a pet lamb. And they had to paint the blood over the door of the house. And what did God do then? 
he saw the blood on the house as he came through in the night and he said, that household is my people, I'm going to save them. Is that an upper or a downer? That's an up, isn't it? So this terrible thing happened in the night and all the Egyptian little boys died and all the Israelites were saved, which is an amazing thing, isn't it? And then the, the Pharaoh said, oh, I've had enough, go, go, go. Was that a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, it's a good thing. So, I think we need to get back to what, what we need to do. So God cares for us just like he cared for all the people in Israel back in those days. Is that an up or is that a down? I think that's an up. God cares for us so much. And we still have our ups and downs when we're good and we're bad and we're noisy and when we're quiet. But even in our ups and downs, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Is that a good or a bad thing? Mm. It, was, it was sad at the time, wasn't it? But it's good for us. So if we believe in Jesus and we ask him to come in our hearts, he makes a way for us to go to heaven because Jesus loves us so much. Isn't that great? So we have, to look, we have to look to Jesus when we're not feeling so good. So let's pray. Let's pray. Shut your eyes. Dear God, we know that the, some of the things we do are not pleasing to you when we're naughty, but we're so thankful for Jesus who sets us free from our naughtiness and our sins. So please, Jesus, uh, allow us to be your children today. Amen. Tanya's got a song called Tis So Sweet that to Trust in Jesus. Well, let's sing. It's a great song. us pray. Heavenly Father, we are here to worship you. And Lord, I believe that you have placed these words on my heart. Um, I pray that you will announce the words as they come out. Father, give us ears to hear not what I say, but what you want to say to us today. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Right. I don't know about you, but we turn on the TV and we see interest rates and we go, ouch. Um, when you owe money and the interest rates go up, we groan. When you have money in savings and the interest rates go up, we smile. <laughs> but Cobus and I are owing money on our house and every time the interest rates go up, we go, ouch, that hurts. Um, we don't like to be in debt. We want to pay our debts and not owe anything. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he told them to not let any debt be outstanding. So, we are doing well in paying our debts and be known as people who pay what we owe. But there's one debt that we just cannot pay. As I prepared for today's message and I mulled over the readings that we've heard, it once again dawned on me that we can't mess with God. He told Pharaoh through Moses and Aaron that the Israelite people are his treasured possession. He claimed his stake, or he staked his claim, sorry, but Pharaoh chose not to listen. Despite all the chances that he had, Pharaoh denied God's power and stubbornly refused to give in until it came to the point where God killed the firstborn sons. When Steve was reading it, I actually saw that it says the firstborn of the Egyptians. I always thought it was only the boys, but I don't know whether I'm right now. <laughs> anyway, God went to those, um, extent, that extent to kill their firstborn children. Um, we heard that God gave very specific directions for the Israelite people that they had to do so that the angel of death would pass over them, their houses. We are not told whether all of God's people followed his instructions. We assume they did as they were told and they were set free. However, God was very clear when he said that the angel of death will pass over the houses where there was blood on the doorposts. God's people had to choose to obey, to obey him. No one was saved simply because they were descendants of Israel. God saved his people, something they would never have been able to do for themselves. And as we follow their story, we see that they were actually prepared to settle for less. They thought, oh no, please, just don't let these hard things happen. Um, we will go back and we will just be slaves, that's all right. And I wonder how often we settle for less. Um, and we are scared to trust God's promises because they seem so impossible for us to attain. If we think that this is just not possible, but nothing is impossible for God. Now, a few weeks ago, I went on a spiritual retreat with the area chaplains of youth care. And while we were there, we were, uh, were paired up in prayer partners. And I was paired up with a young girl who was who's in the CVE team. And we had the most amazing times of prayer. And at this place where we were for the spiritual retreat, there was a labyrinth. And we were talking about when you walk the labyrinth, you can see the end goal. It's right there. And so you follow this path. And then when you're nearly there, the path takes you away. And you go all the way to the, to the end again. And then you have to follow the path again. And then when I got home a week or so later, she sent me a book 
called Hind's Feet on High Places by Hannah Hernet. And it's an allegory dramatizing the yearning of God's children to be led to new heights of love, joy, and victory. And in this book, a girl called Much Afraid was led by the shepherd to the high places where she would be completely healed and freed from her enemies of fear, pride, self-pity, bitterness, and resentment. But instead of leading her straight up the, to the high places, she was led away from the high places through the desert on the shores of loneliness with only sorrow and suffering accompanying her. Um, and on this journey, she learned that even though she couldn't always see the shepherd, he was always nearby. She only needed to call. She learned to embrace sorrow and suffering and allow them to walk with her. And she learned that she could trust the shepherd, that he is faithful and true. And when the voices of doubt and fear were urging her to abandon the shepherd, he didn't scold her. He only encouraged her to trust him. Um, we come to the Romans reading today. And Paul points out two things in this passage. The one is that we are to love abundantly. When we read the Old Testament, we read about all these laws God gave to his people. God is holy. I don't think we understand how holy he is and how unable we are to come into his presence. Nothing and no one impure can ever enter his presence. This is why the Old Testament priests had to go through so many rituals to enter the most holy place of the temple. And even when they went through all these cleansing rituals, they were still not able to see God face to face. Sacrifices had to be made endlessly. There are chapters and chapters of laws, which we know from the history of God's people, no one was to obey. And God knew that we will not be able to obey all these laws. And this is why Jesus came. The Jews became so fixated on the laws that they lost the spirit of these laws. And when Jesus came to earth, he often got very annoyed with the church people because they were burdening the people with laws. And Jesus said, that all those chapters and chapters of laws can be summarized in two. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength, and love others as you love yourself. And then Paul is reiterating what Jesus said in verses 8 to 10 of Romans 13, that we must love one another as we love ourselves. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Coming back to my earlier question about how we can ever repay God for what he has done for us, this is the answer. Love others as God loves us. The first reason to love others abundantly is because God loves us abundantly. When we ponder on God's love for us, Love wells up inside of us, and it just oozes from us. This is the reason why spending time with God is so important. In our busyness, it is so easy to just glance over God's love for us, and then love for others become a chore. When we make time to sit at Jesus' feet, and allow his word 
to penetrate our deepest core, we experience God's love, and then love for others flow naturally. The second reason to love others abundantly is in obedience to God's command. We love God, and because we love him, we want to obey him. Paul essentially says, we cannot go wrong when we love others. In practice, this can be hard, because some people just rub us up the wrong way. They simply seem to bring out the worst in us. And how on earth can we love them? When we look at Jesus' journey on earth, we saw that he wasn't treated with respect. On the contrary, he was looked down upon by the leaders of the church. They did everything in their power to get rid of him even paying one of his own to betray him. Yet, when he was on the cross, he prayed for them, asking the Father to forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. Could we do the same? Can we ask God to give us eyes to see others as he sees them? Can we ask the Holy Spirit to give us the love to share with others? Coming back to the book that I read, it was only once much afraid put her own desires on the altar that she reached the high places. And when she was there, she looked down to the valley of humiliation where she came from and she saw her enemies, fear, pride, self-pity, resentment, bitterness, for the broken people they are. And she was filled with so much love and compassion for them that she wanted to go back and share the freedom of following the shepherd with them. The second point is that Paul urges us to live intentionally. In verses 11 to 14, he says that we have to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we get up in the morning, we are intentional with what we put on. The clothes don't just jump out of the wardrobe. We choose what we are putting on. We also take off our pajamas. Most of us don't layer up clean clothes over dirty clothes. We change. When it is a day that we're going to spend in the garden, we dress differently from when we are going on a date night or when we're going out for dinner. In the same way, we have to intentionally make a decision to live as people of the light. We have to choose moment by moment what we want to look like. Are we putting on deeds of darkness and gratifying the desires of the flesh? Or are we choosing to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Our natural tendency is self-gratification. We want to feel good. We want to satisfy our own needs. However, Paul says in verse 12 that the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Paul is talking about the night in reference to the time of, of reign of sin on earth. And he is talking about day in, the ref, in reference to the return of Jesus when he will reign as king in the new heaven and the new earth. In, in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes about putting on the armor of God. So we have to take off the things of the darkness. Paul loosely identifies three areas where many people in our world struggle. Controlling our lives, when he talks about the carousing and drunkenness, 
controlling our bodies when he talks about sexual immorality and debauchery and controlling our emotions when he talks about dissension and jealousy. We know as Christians that we face many other temptations too. Maybe these were the areas that were particularly troubling to the Romans. I wonder what he would have written to us today. I think the takeaway from the passage is that we have to put aside, cast off everything that is not of Christ and put on the armor of light. Behave decently in the life to which Jesus has redeemed us. To put on Jesus Christ is to choose humility, forgiveness, purity, self-control, kindness, patience, generosity, wisdom, joy, and love. Everything that makes us more like Jesus. Paul warns us to not waste time thinking about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. We have to catch ourselves and redirect our thoughts to how we can be a blessing instead of how we can please ourselves. So, what can we do this week to show God how much we appreciate that Jesus has paid our debt? We can identify a way that we can love someone else. Let's think of one person and decide, how can I show love to that person this week? And the second thing is to think of a practical way we can put on Jesus before we get out of bed every morning. Let us live every day as though Jesus can may return today, not with fear and trepidation, but with a, a feeling of such excitement that today may be the day. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we ask you to please come and fill our hearts. Kindle in us the fire of your love. And please help us to love and live as you call us to. In your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Sal. Um, Debbie, would you be able to come forward? Please remain standing as uh, Kevin comes forward and takes the Bible out.
out of the chapel, it signifies that while our weekly worship has ended, we continue into the week under the authority and the guidance of the Word of God. And our blessing this morning is a very traditional blessing, the blessing from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. Amen.